Hello and welcome to The Gaggle, where we challenge and, if necessary, destroy media narratives. I'm George Samueli, and with me today is uh, co-founder of The Gaggle, Kira Haley. Well, it's that time of the week, Saturday, when we give the thumbs up and thumbs down for the week, and many people are dreading uh, what we're going to uh, find this week. Yeah. Um, I will go first with my uh, thumbs up. Um, my thumbs up is a little, it was maybe a little bit surprising. It's uh, President Obrador of uh, Mexico. Uh, unlike uh, almost every uh, other a political leader uh, in the world, he hasn't rushed to um, embrace uh, Joe Biden. He has um, done the correct uh, and perfectly appropriate diplomatic thing of not intervening in the US election process and as said, has not issued any uh, congratulations um, to uh, Joe Biden and uh, said that he is waiting for the uh, election litigation process to end and the official authorities in the United States to uh, declare uh, who the next president will be. Mm -hmm. Now, what is interesting about this is who he is. He is a president of Mexico. He's also a man on the left. And yet he seems to enjoy extraordinarily good relations with um, President Trump, the racist and whatnot that we've been hearing about. And one of the interesting things about it, because, and here it goes back to a, um, actually one of the few successes of the Trump administration is that he has um, brought to an end the uh, stream of uh, immigrants across the border and that has resulted in something that we haven't seen in a number of years in the US economy, uh, a rise in the pay of people at the bottom of the ladder. We've had rises in pay of people at the top, spectacular rises in pay, but it's been characteristic of the Trump years that there has been a rise in pay of the people at the bottom. And that's without question as a result of the policies of the uh, tighter labor market. And so yeah. the tighter labor market, uh, the pay of the people at the bottom uh, goes up. And he has found a partner in this, in uh, President um, Obrador, who um, has cooperated with, um, uh, with Trump in um, uh, limiting the people who come across uh, Mexico from Central America and into the United States. And he has allowed uh, for people who are seeking asylum to wait in Mexico uh, before they uh, enter the United States. In other words, they can't just enter the United States, claim asylum, and then just disappear within the legal process. So Obrador has cooperated with that and, and has found, um, a, you know, a, worked out a rather surprisingly uh, collegial uh, relationship with President Trump. And um, George, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm, I'm quite sure that he's quite a popular uh, figure in Mexico. Uh, given the fact that he's quite he stabilized the economy a lot right. and there has been a reversal of the flow of immigrants and people are actually returning to Mexico to take up new positions within the city itself and right. yep. are returning yep. there's been a reversal particularly this year and um, in people coming back to Mexico right he's been he's successful um in the, yeah, his, his economic policies have been successful yeah. and um and yeah, he's been a, a, an effective president. And I, I think that um, it, it's, a, it's a very surprising that, that he has worked out this um, uh, collegial relationship. And I think that he's not at all happy with the, um, the immigration policies of the uh, coming um, Biden administration, which is essentially promising uh, to open up the borders which means that again, Mexico is going to have to uh, put up with um, people uh, from Central America and South America crossing uh, Mexico to get to the uh, to the United States. So he's not really looking forward to uh, the arrival of uh, yeah. Harris. Um, this, this is the other thing that, that most people who are detained at the border um, or in these detainment camps are actually not Mexicans, but from- No, that's right. Um, they're not. They're, not. they're yeah. usually from um, other, other, other countries in Central America or from anywhere. I mean, you just, you know, you just simply trek, trek across Mexico and get to the border. So that, by, you know, yeah, exactly, by no means are they Mexican. Simply slash treacherously try and make it across the desert. Which is right. Yeah. Very... It, it's definitely a highly, a highly risky um, venture. And it's, and it's again, it's, uh, you know, 
really irresponsible people, particularly when they're traveling with uh, children uh, to put children into this, through this ordeal, a very dangerous journey in which children could, could easily get killed. Mm -hmm. um, well, I will counter your thumbs up with my thumbs down and I'd be down to what you think about this latest um, announcement that is the only person to have two very bad big losses in a row in presidential races is potentially going to be awarded a high position and that is of course Hillary Clinton who is currently being considered as the United States ambassador to the United Nations by uh, President-elect Joe Biden and as I said the only person to lose twice in a row only to be awarded such high accolades and um, of course now the Senate would have to approve this which I don't imagine they would be too keen on uh, signing off on but I want to know what you think about this suggestion. Well you know Shout George I, back. Yeah well you know when I saw this story I, I have to say I, I was a little surprised because um uh, it would be a step down for her. I mean, she had been. It's a demotion. Yeah. It's a demotion. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely, because the the, uh, the permanent representative at the UN is uh, somebody who is subordinate to the Secretary yeah. of State. He takes yeah. orders from the Secretary of State. So, it would be a demotion. But uh, you know, so some people are so uh, narcissistic that they have to be in the public eye. So, I I, I wouldn't rule out the possibility that she is indeed being contemplated in that position and that she would accept it uh you know so that she's in the public eye there she is she'll be there at the un um denouncing russia and i'm sure she she just relishes the opportunity to get into verbal spats with uh, russia at the at the security council so I, but you're absolutely right this is a, a complete failure this is she's she's run twice for president failed spectacularly uh nice. both times against the uh, not, not terribly strong candidates. Uh, and, but the idea of having her back in public life and therefore the Clintons back in public life does fill one with dread. And I, you know, <laughs> it is a very good thumbs down. <laughs> yeah, and I think the reasoning that they're using behind nominating her is that she would be able to mend the image of the US abroad. So I think yeah. quite <laughs> Again, yes, exactly. The idea of the Clintons and their um, and all their rackets, their money raising rackets, somehow uh, raise the U.S. image abroad. Um, I mean, again, we get to the um, a kind of the the bubble that's in Washington. That maybe in the eyes of Washington, the people who talk to one another in Washington, just say, "Well, this is going to do great things for the U.S. abroad," but. It will actually do nothing in the US. People, people just will be holding their heads in their hands. Oh my God, the Clintons are back. Not again. Not again. Yes, exactly. And then, of course, the whole fundraising racket starts again because then now, now that she's in a position of influence, uh, the money will start pouring into the Clinton Foundation again because, well, now she's a person that it's worth um, bankrolling. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make very fancy speeches at different events. I'm sure. Right, exactly, exactly. So, so I, I was a little surprised when I saw the news. No, 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 this can't be right. Is it uh, because you know she, she's not going to take a demotion? Um, but then I thought, no, that that sounds right. Right, somehow. Um, I mean, there was another person um, who Donna Shalala, who I you probably don't remember her. She was she had the, some kind of a cabinet position in the first Clinton administration. In the, in, in the 1990s. And then she ran for Congress and, and was elected. And again, you think, you know, you were a cabinet secretary, you know, now you're, um, you know, you're just simply a Congress person. I mean, that seems like a, a step down. But I guess, again, you know, with people so narcissistic and they want to be in the public eye, um, that's what they'll do. Uh, so yeah. Now I'm back. But yeah, I feel like it's a bit of a syndrome of always wanting to have a piece of pie. No matter right. how small that piece may, may seem. <laughs> um, but I also want to give you a thumbs up. Okay, good. Which is following on from our conversation yesterday about uh, the New York Times. Okay. Um, and I was quite surprised to see a critical piece by the New York magazine, um, which it was not, it wasn't overly critical, but it basically points out the New York Times fall from grace and how 
they have gone from a paper of record to being a paper of resistance, they say. Um, which was interesting because, you know, usually they don't contradict one another. No, no, that's exactly right, because um, people dread uh, antagonizing the New York Times because then they're, they're, they're frightened of what the New York Times will do to them and what it'll write about them. And of course, they all want to write for the New York Times, maybe as an op-ed or they want to be quoted in the New York Times or they would like a job at the New York Times. So, uh, so yeah, people are very reluctant to say anything um, negative on the record about the New York Times. I, I haven't read this article. Are there people on the record there who, who are saying critical things? Yeah, so in the, the article is basically just an opinion piece itself on, on the fall from grace and the degradation of, of pieces and basically the integrity of the, of the paper itself and its goals and what the goals are. And rather than just you know being a paper record recording facts and reporting objectively it's become a nice piece of resistance for obviously the left yeah, and right. stating so, things before having all the facts there and right. ready but also spinning stories in such a way that are obviously meant to have influence over people's thoughts right um, that's right yeah i yeah. know yeah, that exactly yeah. Yeah. yeah because what you've got really is a complete um loss of any distinction between reporting and editorializing. I mean, there was always, uh, you know, they always tended to blend into uh, one another, but at least reporters used to pretend that, uh, well, this is, this is the reporting side of the paper as opposed to the editorial side of the paper. But now every, every single article you read is just all editorializing. It's all yeah. the reporters giving their opinions. Yeah, it's exactly. It's completely, completely uh, infiltrated with the, a blend between fact and opinion, which right, you know, exactly. So, it's so in integrity in your in your work and integrity in your journalism, you're not supposed to side. You're supposed to be objective completely. That's absolutely not the case. Right. Anymore. Exactly. That's right. Exactly. And so it's almost there's no there's no point to reading the New York Times. At least you could think, okay, I may not agree with the New York Times, but I'll read it because there'll be some reporting here. I will find out something that I didn't know yeah. before. Um, but now, you know, we're, 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 I, I know what the New York Times is going to say. I mean, it, it's going to re report in such a way as to make me want to hate Trump. I mean, that's it. So I, I don't need to read this. Yeah, I think it's a good exercise in critical thinking. That's why you should read it. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I'll teach you not to believe headlines. So is, this is not a long, uh, this is just an opinion piece? It's yeah, not, this, it's, this it's this not a long just, investigative it's not, piece. it's not an investigation. It's just a general comment. Okay, well, that sounds, that sounds good. Maybe, you know, maybe you should... Um, yeah, put that into the yeah. there's also I, uh, alongside this actually uh viva fry who came to join us on yes. the show before he's done a few videos uh picking apart quite a few of their pieces they did in, on election coverage they're very informed very good and um, i'll put a link down below for anyone who wants to check right. them out yeah. but again also just how manipulative words can be and how the style of worth worth wordsmithing um, it's really just telling you that your opinion is wrong and yes. my opinion is right. This is why you believe <laughs> no, that, that, I mean, the, the, the New York Times is a, is a classic um, uh, case in how they, uh, uh, how, how they write, how they use their particular words. I mean, um, I remember reading somebody some years ago when, when, whenever they write about, say, politics in another country and the political leader, he, 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 they never say, he said he said this. They say he snarled, he sneered, um, he chortled, uh, <laughs> he said snidely. Uh, whereas the um, people they like, the opposition or whatever, they say they always observe, they note. Yeah. Um, noble noble they, words. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, even this little word, you know, it's always in a way to calculate it to make you hate whom the New York Times wants you to hate and and like whom. The, oh, well, well, he obviously coolly observes as opposed to one which just snarls. I, I have a problem with the way they use quantifiers such as saying majority right. or no major issues or widespread. I mean, what is widespread? Everyone has their own opinion on how to find something that's widespread. Such right. same case with majority, the same case with most of, and it's not actual statistical information or facts you know no, no, that, uh, but that, it's, that, fun, it's fun as such it's fun as such um 
But no, that's, that's exactly right. That, that, that's exactly you, using these words like widespread. You really don't know, you know, what does that mean? Exactly. Uh, what does that mean exactly? What yeah, twenty percent, fifty percent, eighty percent. I mean, that, that's it. So, <laughs> uh, it's, it's defined within what you think widespread means. Right. Which right. is different oh. for every person. Right. Right. Same way that you can use it, like systematic or saying that there was no major issues. So what is a major issue? What is a minor issue? Yeah, that's right. That's yeah. It's all exactly, exactly. There's a, you know, yeah. there's also just yes, this is a minor issue, and so it's like, but you know, you can get ten minor issues, and then and another kind of actually, George, another thumbs up I want, which would be my final thumbs up, I wanted to mention is I've been reading a lot of articles on some positive things that have come out of the 2020 race, and a lot of people point towards what they predict to be a definite realignment of um the political scales in in america and predicted that because both parties are at such clashing extremities and uh, there has to be a reckoning there has to be a reckoning for both parties and there's predictions that 2020 it's this political evolution and it will bring this realignment no matter who is the final uh, winner of the election and who is the one that will be leading the country from now on which I, which I think is time time enough um, right, right. and I'm looking uh, further into it there's a lot of theories that it's around every 60 years anyway that the US goes through an era of political reform um, and on that time scale historically speaking it is time for another right. <laughs> section right. of political reform Right. Well, it's, uh, I mean, that's an interesting uh, question because you've got the Republican Party, which is, you know, a, a very odd coalition of uh, corporate interests that yeah. cares about uh, tax cuts for the rich, uh, cheap uh, labor, and therefore unrestricted immigration. And then you've got the kind of the, the working class base, which is, you know, the, the working class now largely support uh, the Republican. It's a very uneasy uh, alliance. Oh, yeah. uh, and then you've got the Democrats who are right now uh, in a, uh, involved in a bitter fight uh, between um, the, the so-called moderates, the sort of Pelosi's, Clyburn's, the Democrat leaders, who are accusing the AOC's and the yeah. squad of having lost this election uh, for them. So, yeah. And so you've got, uh, you know, there's, there's essentially the fighting as to who, who, which one is Biden. If Biden kind of tries to appease the AOC, they think, well, that's it. You know, you're going to lose the next election. Uh, you know, people don't yeah. want this. Yeah, whereas the AOC say, hey, you want to? If Biden tries to just become another uh, corporate uh, entity, you're going to lose the election. So, so it's kind of like both both parties are really uh, yeah. bitterly divided. I, and I think this this whole election cycle has shown the cracks that exist within both parties, coupled with a lot of mistrust and public dissatisfaction with institutions and within institutions, which is a big, like, that's an important element when it comes to any kind of reform or renaissance in, in the political machine. Um, when you have this then coupled with or against this hyper-partisan warfare, it has to end up with something being changing, something changing or evolving. Right. Right. No, that's, uh, um, uh, you know, you, you know, you never know where it's um, uh, where the changes are going to go. I mean, if you, you look at the political map um, of, the, of the United States, let's say you have an, the election 1948 and, and the election in 2020, and there's always complete switch. You know, these were the Democratic states in 1948. These were the Republican states. All of the states that now we say the blue wall. <laughs> the, the Democrats were all controlled by the Republicans, you know, all the stuff all the, uh, the, in the Northeast, um, uh, New York, and, and so on. That was all controlled by uh, the Republicans. The Democrats <laughs> controlled uh, the South, sort of what now is the heartland. So it's, a, like, it's been a complete switch. It began in the 1960s um, with, with the collapse of the Democratic Party in, in the South. Uh, so that, yeah, there, you know, it was about 60 years ago, there was this uh, major political realignment. And you have to think that, you know, something of the sort will happen now. Um, yeah. And, you know, and, and it could even get violent. You know, there could be, you know, you know, people who might just want to opt out of the United States. So, you know, there's this like, yeah. another 
civil war, maybe not, not necessarily a violent one, but, um, but you know, effectively a kind of a secession from the state. Yeah, in some shape or form, for sure. Yeah. I think we can expect to see that in the next few years, at least right. four years of this presidency you might then swing back to four years of an extreme, right. extreme Republican presidency. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, my thumbs up is kind of a variant on the, um, well, not on my thumbs up, I've already had a thumbs up, it's my thumbs down. My thumbs down is a variant on my uh, thumbs up. And that go, it goes back to the, uh, the question of um, who is uh, recognizing the, uh, this election and uh, Joe Biden as the vice president uh, elect. And what's kind of interesting about this is yes, the Europeans have you know, rushed to say, yeah, 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 you know, Biden's vice president elect, and they're having telephone conversations, and you know, like Boris Johnson, and Macron, and Frau Merkel, and they're all having these. Uh, Although I do think George Boris Johnson's been accused of quite a few slip ups with who he's congratulating. I don't know if you've seen this. Right, yeah, yeah. But I think, I mean, when he spoke in Parliament the other day, I mean, he was speaking, he said, yes, uh, you know, I had an excellent conversation, you know, with Vice President of the Lake Biden and, and so on. But yeah, I mean, yeah, by, by, yeah Bob, Boris Johnson is a classic, you know, he, you know he, he likes to do the slip up. It's part of his <laughs> speech. Just like, you know, the, the carefully, the shirt hanging out at the back of his trousers, you know, it's all carefully cultivated, you know, he pulls. Exactly, he pulls out his shirt just before he goes out of the, out of the house. Um, uh, yeah, so, but what is interesting about that is that they're actually having substantive policy discussions when you, because Macron says that um, uh, uh, we're going to make the planet great again. So in other words, uh, he, he's been told explicitly by Biden that we're going to re-enter the, um, the Paris Climate Accord. Yeah. Um, and and again, he's you know you know made all sorts of uh, promises to Europeans how he's going to reverse um, Trump's policies. Now, what is interesting about this is that um, the Democrats, uh, what they did to Trump when they were in power, and made this whole Logan Act nonsense over General Flynn. Remember, General Flynn, at the end of December, had that phone conversation with um, uh, Ambassador Kislyak, and, and basically he, he did not discuss sanctions or anything. All he said to, to Kislyak after Obama had announced uh, sanctions and the expulsion of Russian diplomats, um, Flynn essentially told uh, Kislyak, perfectly reasonably, don't overreact. Um, and, and, and that was all. This the Obama people, including Biden, used this conversation in order to uh, you know, bring the Logan Act uh, charges against um, Flynn and justified their continued uh, surveillance of Flynn because he had violated the Logan Act um, because he was talking to uh, the representative of another government. He was undermining the policy of the current administration. So not only is there this blatant, you know, outrageous hypocrisy in what the Democrats are now doing, but at the time that Flynn was actually having these discussions, Trump really was the president-elect because that election had by then been certified. The College of Electors had, had met, uh, they had uh, selected um, Trump as the president. So he was the president-elect. Biden is not president-elect. Trump has not conceded. The, the election is being litigated. Uh, not, no elections have been certified. The College of Electors hasn't met. He is not the vice president elect. Uh, so, so it's not only is there this blatant hypocrisy on the part of the Democrats and Biden, who was involved in all of that with nonsense with Flynn, but you know, even on the, on the very narrow issue, Trump and Flynn had much more legal, solid legal arguments for doing what they did than Biden does. Yeah. And I, well, I think for Trump is proving how much of a president he still is by his rush to pass uh, those new, the new um, changes in the Pentagon, for example. Right. Um, right. And the 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 troops, the troops. But, 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 yeah, but, yeah, yeah, no, exactly. I mean, I think he's going to try and get as much done as he can <laughs> of, of his never, agenda. He's never worked as hard before in his life. Exactly, like Jan, before, <laughs> yeah, before January uh, 20. Uh, we can hope, as we, we mentioned um, yesterday, that uh, on the agenda is uh, a pardon for um, Julian Assange and uh, Edward Snowden. Um, 
because if he doesn't do it, then that would be very remiss because um, uh, then that pretty much all hope is lost for um, Assange because the Democrats really want to get their hands on him. And, and I think the British will just, you know, they'll, they'll just follow blindly what, whatever the Americans want. So there's no, no hope from the British courts and then there'd be no hope from the US courts. So this would be uh, Julian Assange's really best, best hope of walking free. It's best bet, yeah. 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 Um, I mean, of course, again, Trump should have done this a long time ago, um, but he didn't. I mean, like a lot of things he should have done a long time ago. And he, in, in a way, he's paying the price for not having done them. No, it's hard to do one a month and a, maybe let's say one, one month, two months, and he's going to try and do it all. Right. Yeah, you should. You just, just you know, absolutely just, you know, smart scramble. I mean, just uh, <laughs> I, you fire everybody. I mean, fire all these people. At least they have it. They'll have it on their resumes. Hey, I was fired, you know, as director of the FBI. So you, you, so you can't actually walk away from that. You know, you, you were actually fired. So that's, you know. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, it, it absolutely should. I mean, these people, you know, these 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 characters, have always worked against him. They sabotage him. I mean, he shouldn't have appointed them, um, but having appointed them, then he should have fired them a, a long time ago. Yeah, in a way, he did shoot himself in the in his own foot quite <laughs> big time. Yep. Yeah, that's right. Uh, well, those are our um, thumbs ups and thumbs downs for the week. Um, and uh, next uh, Saturday, we will be back with, with more terrifying thumbs ups and thumbs downs. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Kira. Um, and um, if you like the gaggle, please like, share, and uh, subscribe. Uh, see you soon. Bye.